Good to see you this morning. We had an earlier service over at our Magnolia campus. Great service over there. We baptized four folks this morning over there. It was a great time in the Lord. It's never too late. We baptized four old folks. They're like my age, you know. Uh, if you have a little crippling arthritis, that ice cold water doesn't help it a whole lot. So. But it was a great time of the Lord, great fellowship, great ministry time, full house just to worship and serve the Lord. It's great. It's always exciting to have baptismal services and uh, seeing people come to confess their faith openly and publicly to Jesus. Amen. We're in our series on Nehemiah. In fact, this is part three in Nehemiah. And as we're dealing with part three, we're moving forward in the, what we've entitled the making of a leader. In Nehemiah chapter one, you see the the, the integrity of this man, you see his character, you see here's a man who, who had a private life as well as a public life, and that's what makes genuine leaders. A lot of times it, uh, that's probably the most overlooked in our culture and society when it comes to appointing leaders in the world that we live in, but it's one of the most important things according to what the Bible says. Not pretend character, not pretend integrity, you know, but the truth of the matter that a person is in private what they are in public. They're in public what they are in private. There's no make-believe here. There's no self-standard of what's moral and what's immoral. It's a, they go by a standard of what God has to say. And looking at the life of Nehemiah, you see here's a man who is what he says he is. He lives his life. He lives it openly and publicly. He's genuine. He has integrity. He's loyal. He's faithful. He's steadfast. We saw that in, as we looked at the first parts of chapter 1. And then we moved in chapter 2 to prayer life and the importance of leaders. And if you're going to be a good leader on any level, you need to learn how to pray. And please understand, let me back up just a little bit by saying this. We're all leaders if we're believers, all right? God has called us to be leaders. Remember we said in that first lesson that one of the biggest things about leadership is if you want to identify what leadership is, is that leadership is influence. We're influencing people. We're making a difference in people's life. Jesus tells us very carefully and very deliberately in scriptures that we are the light of the world. We are the salt of the earth. One thing about light and salt is, they are difference makers. They influence the environment that's around them. Salt acts as a preservative. Salt acts as a, as a flavoring kind of thing. It also uh, it has a, a healing basis to it. There's a lot we could say about it, but the idea is that it makes a difference when you apply salt to it, all right? It's the same thing with light. You walk in a dark room, the darkness flees when the lights come on. We are to be that kind of influencer in life. In other words, we're not little spiritual thermometers that sit around and say, oh, it's, it's, isn't God good? It's, uh, these people aren't very spiritual. These people are spiritual and kind of gauge it out what we feel about. No, we're, we're thermostats. We go in and we, we, we make a difference. We set what the standard ought to be. We set what the temperature ought to be. And so we're making a difference. Leadership is, is lost in the, in the church today. And the, I think the biggest leaders in our culture or ought not be the atheistic and agnostic and, you know, just people who say they have a walk with God but have no walk with God. It ought to be people in public life and faith who are really on fire for Jesus that are making a difference in the world that they're in. Those are the people who make the best leaders according to what the Bible teaches about leadership. And we see in the life of Nehemiah what it means to be a leader and what it takes to be a leader. He is submissive to the king obviously, but he's also in charge. He's the second in authority. He stands as the cupbearer, the chief of security, kind of like the prime minister, the aide, the, the first voice that the king's going to listen to when he asks for advice. And he's gotten that way, not out of heritage, because he's not even Babylonian. And he's living in a Babylonian empire, right? He, and, and a Medo-Persian empire. I mean, he, he, he's, he's, he's that way because, one, he's a child of God. He worships God. He loves God. But his, his whole family has been brought into captivity. He, he's born in, 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 in Persia, all right? would be today modern Iran. And he's there as a child of God, but he ascends and climbs the ladder to a successful place of leadership in the nation because of his integrity. And it's important. If you're going to say, I, I want to be a leader, that you deal with those issues of character before you deal with anything else. Last week, we looked at the fact that he learned how to pray. If you're going to be a leader, you're going to have to learn how to pray. Leaders just don't kind of come up with an idea. Biblical leaders, godly leaders, good leaders are people who know how to spend time with God. And we talked about the importance of praying. Now, a lot of times when I talk to Christian leaders, you get, there's, there's kind of two worlds there. One, one, you have what you call the pragmatist Christian leader. And then you have what I call the spiritual Christian leader. Uh, but there's two extremes almost. There, there is a marriage between those two. 
The pragmatist over here, he, it's all about plans. It's all about, you know, uh, uh, getting it all laid out and engineering a, a, a system. And over here with, with, the, with the, uh, the spiritual leader, it's, kind of, it's all about prayer. Let's just pray and let God. I, I remember going to a lot of different churches uh, before we started the church here. And you could always tell which, where the pastor was and uh, if you got an order of service or not. You know, if you got an order of service, there's usually a more pragmatic guy. He had a plan. He had something, you know. And, and over here, the guy over here, you, said, you tell him you have an order of service, he'd laugh at you. And his, 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 he'd laugh at you. He'd go, oh, we're, we're more spiritual than that. We don't need an order of service, you know. We, 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 just, we pray about it, and we're just going to let the Holy Spirit lead, which usually meant the service went three or four hours long. <laughs> which would be all right if the Holy Spirit was really leading. There's nothing wrong with being that person is I want God to lead and God to be in charge. But also God puts it upon us as his leaders and his principal, uh, principal chief uh, you know, allies in, on the planet you know, to be pragmatic and blend that with leadership of being a spiritual leader as well. So there is a place for both. And where you see that in, in an individual more than any other, I believe, at least in the Old Testament, you certainly see it in the life of Nehemiah, the way it lays out his life. And remember, we said these first chapters are more like a journal. Some people believe that the latter part of Nehemiah was written by Ezra, and it's very clear the way it's written, but the first part was written by Nehemiah as he lays out carefully in the first person, this is me, this is what happened, this is how it happened, this is what I said, this is what I said, this is what they said. And it's almost written in a journal form to give us a clarity on how the whole thing falls out to the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem, how, the God, how God did all those things. But the first is character. The second is prayer. The third brings us to this part where Nehemiah, we're going to see very carefully, he's a planner. He, he's got, he comes up with a plan. He's not just, you know, just going well, to pray about it and then do nothing or pray about it and expect God to do something. He understands there's a balance between faith and works. You know, that faith without works is dead. And he understands that God has, ha, is the one who's going to initiate all that. It's important we learn how to, to plan. It's important if you're going to be a spiritual leader, you learn how to plan. And there's, there's several reasons for that, that that we can look at today. And there's three reasons, first of all, and then I'm going to give you about six or seven other reasons for what we're doing. This is not working, so you're going to have to follow along as best as possible. All right? Uh, let, me look, let me just read this passage in Nehemiah chapter 2. Here we go. How about that? And it came about in the month of Nisan, the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, that wine was before him, and I took up the wine and I gave it to the king. Now, I had not been sad in his presence... So the king said to me, why is your face sad, though you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of heart. Then I was very much afraid. And I said to the king, hey, why is he afraid? If you were studying with us in Proverbs last month, we were going through the book of Proverbs. One thing you saw as we got to chapter 16 was it talks about how to act in the presence of the king if you're going to be a wise person. And it talks about the way you conduct yourself in the presence of the king if you're going to be a wise person. It talks about the words you would choose and how to choose them carefully if you're in the presence of the king. It even talks about the attitude in chapter 16 that you portray, you know, that, 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 you have, that you're, you're, you're there and you can influence the king's behavior by your attitude and by your words and so he you know he says uh, uh you know the king expects everybody to be happy all the time and he says and i wasn't happy at least it showed up on my face and he said what is going on here verse three tells him the reason let the king live forever which is the best way to start why should my face not be sad when the city the place of my father's tombs lies desolate and its gates have been consumed by fire he realized in fact he doesn't mention jerusalem at this part you know why because the king's already said jerusalem walls won't be rebuilt he just says the city, might, well, by the way, the king is smart enough to know that, you know, Nehemiah's a Jew and he's talking about his home. But he also realized that it's interesting that Nehemiah appeals to something that's very important in the life of the Mideastern family and the Mideastern person, not just Jew, but also Arab and also Babylonian, Iranian, the importance of the burial places of your fathers and the respect that you had and that you held for those, those, those burial sites. And the king said to me in verse 4, what would you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said to the king, If it please the king, and if your servant has found favor before you, send me to Judah, the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. Big, bold question. And the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, How long will your journey be, and when you return? So it pleased the king to send me. And I gave him a definite time. And I said to the king, If it please the king... Let letters be given me for the governors of the provinces beyond the river that they may allow me to pass through until I come to Judah. And also, <laughs> getting real bold, 
a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's force, that I may get me timber to make beams of the gates of the fortress, which is by the temple, and for the wall of the city, and for the house to which I will go. And the king granted them to me because the good hand of my God was on me. And I came to the governors of the province beyond the river, and I gave them the king's letters. And the king had sent me with officers of the army, and he had sent me with horsemen. So he's giving us, a, again, a, a, a journal of how this all lays out and what his plan is. You say, well, why should we plan? Well, let me give you three reasons there why we plan. This is working for me now, so I'll take it. One, first of all, because God does it. In Jeremiah 20, 11, what's the Lord say? I know what? The what? The what? I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. There are plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a good hope and a future. God said, I have a plan. Jesus said, I have a plan. What's Jesus say his plan is? I've come that you might have life and you might have that life more abundantly. All through scriptures, you see God moving with a plan, whether it's Noah or Moses, the departure of the Jews. From, I mean, all along you see these plans that are being worked out. In fact, God says that God is not a God of disorder, but he is a God of, uh, uh, of, of peace. In other words, he has a plan. Now, if God plans for stuff, let's not be so spiritual, I use the word carefully, that we don't have a plan as well. God plans. Not only does God plan, God commands it. 1 Corinthians 14, everything should be done in a fitting and an orderly way. In other words, you approach things with a plan. And he's even talking about the church. When you get together, make sure there's a plan that we can do things in the right order and in the right way that it brings glory to God is the whole idea. Proverbs 4, watch the feet of your path. All right, we'll go back to that. Excuse me. Back. Watch the feet of your path. And all your plans will be established. The good news translation will be plan carefully what you do. And whatever you do will turn out right. What? When you plan carefully. Proverbs 16, 9. The mind of a man plans his way, but the Lord directs his step. In other words, we make plans because God has made plans and we're to be faithful enough to follow through with the plans ourselves. In Proverbs 16, which is again the last chapter we worked on here together, I believe, when we were studying Proverbs 16, he talks about the importance of the mind of a man is planning in his ways. And that's the word heart in the Hebrew, that in our heart, God's working up a plan. And as we work according to that plan, it's being worked in our spirit and worked in our heart, then God will direct our steps. Nehemiah shows us that very clearly and very perfectly. So don't be this kind of person who sits down without any plans in your life. The third reason we plan is it's good stewardship. I'm going to read you a passage from Ephesians. And Tim just got through with Ephesians here recently. In Ephesians, this is from the Phillips translation. He says, live life then with a due sense of responsibility. Not as men who do not know the meaning of life, but as those who do. Make the best use of your time. Don't be vague, but grasp firmly what you know to be the will of God. In other words, God begins to reveal his will with, then you can't be vague about how you live your life. If God's got a plan for your life and if God's got direction for your life, then we need to discover what that is and start planning and moving and directing our life to fit what God's will is. This deals with simple time management, which just says, I will make the best use of the opportunity that, that's required. You know, it's just good stewardship. It's just good management of your life. It's good management of your money. How am I using my money? I make so much money. What am I going to do with it? I've been given so much time. What am I going to do with it? I've been given a family. How am I going to lead it? I have a career. How am I going to live that? Over and over. And I have a ministry. How are we going to do that? Some of you have been blessed with leadership positions in the church. You're accountable for that. You're responsible for that. To see that it glorifies God and honors God and grows and, and, and disciples and, and leads people to Jesus Christ. What, where's your plan for that? So all the, that's what the Bible even tells us that pastors are called to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. We have a plan for equipping saints to help people grow in their, in their, in their faith and in their walk so they can do the ministry that God's called them to do. So I want to look at today, that, that's reasons we plan right there. Ultimately, that God, God desires it and it's good stewardship on our part. But how do we plan? The first thing is this, and there's about seven here. We'll move through them quickly this morning. But you can go back and deal with this because there's a lot here. In fact, you know, we talk about learning how to appeal when I was bringing my kids up. I wouldn't let my kids be beggars. You know what beggars are. Oh, please, 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 please. Oh, please, 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 please. Oh, come on. And if that didn't work, they'd go to mom and beg mama. Oh, daddy said ask you when daddy didn't say ask you. <laughs> oh, please, 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 please. Yeah, I mean, y'all know what I mean, right? But I want to teach my kids to learn the art of the appeal. 
to learn how to really ask for stuff. Why? Because all through their life, we're going to be asking for stuff. We're going to be asking for a job. You might be asking for a raise. I mean, there's going to be, you're going to be asking for a better deal on the car. You're going to be asking for, a, you know, that's just over and over. So you want to teach it. You want to teach the art of the appeal. How do you make an appeal? Man, this whole lesson in Nehemiah, even though it's not what we've titled it and necessarily the direction we're going with it, watch this carefully. You'll see how to make an appeal and how to teach yourself how to make an appeal and how to teach your kids how to make an appeal. And let me tell you one thing right off the bat, it's not a lot of words. In fact, he who speaks most usually loses. Amen. Go make a deal on a car. You lose if you spend all the time talking. Just shut up. Here's my price. You shut up. Then watch them start moving around and getting, they're waiting for you to talk. The more you talk, the less you're going to do. That's all the free advice you get on that today. All right. <laughs> how, do, how, how, how do leaders lead? Well, let me, let's start here. You got you to, first of all, you think it through. Now, the month of Nisan is the way chapter one starts off. I mean, this chapter two starts off. Chapter one starts off in the month of Shizlev. Now, in the Jewish calendar between Shizlev and Nisan, basically from time it starts to the time he goes through to ask this question, to answer the question of the king, it's been four months. We talked about last week that four months he's been praying. But what's been going on? He's just prayed? No, the more that God shapes this in his heart, remember we talked about, one, God begins to show him, I'm going to send you. I'm not just going to have you pray about this. You're going to be, you're going to be my answer. And then God starts dealing with him, and he responds to that finally. Well, here am I, here am I obviously has to take place. Then from there he goes to, how are we going to do this? Uh, and it's just simply a matter of, I, I need to start thinking this through. And it's, it's prayerful fault and it's prayerful consideration. But out of this praying, I believe, comes planning. In the mind of, uh, in the heart of the man, he plans. And so in his heart, as God spoke to him, he begins to make plans. Howard Hendricks, great professor in theology, said, nothing is more profitable than serious thinking and nothing is more demanding. In fact, we've been talking about leadership laws. We've discovered that leaders have to make time and take time to think and maybe even to get away to think. It's important. The leadership law here would be this. Leaders make the time for think time. We've prayed. We've sought God's face. God's put something in our heart, put something on our mind. It might be in regard to the church. It might be in regard to my family or my child. It might be in regard to my spouse. God's laid me something I need to be praying about. And then... What can I do? That's where we say, Lord, what can I do? And then God begins to stir in your spirit. And, you know, you have to take time for this, though. Proverbs 13 puts it this way. And he says here in Proverbs 13, a wise man thinks ahead and a fool doesn't and even brags about it. Proverbs 14, the wise man looks ahead. The fool attempts to fool himself and won't face the facts. That's, that's where a lot of people are today. They won't face the facts because if they face the facts, then they'll, they'll have to literally have to accept responsibility. And then if it's upon receptive responsibility, then you have to do something. So a lot of people don't want to do anything because they're just spiritually lazy in their life. And so they put stuff off and they won't face issues and they won't acknowledge problems. They just push on down the road and, and think, well, case sera, sera, everything's going to work out. In the book of Proverbs, it is laced continually through chapter after chapter that, that wisdom requires us to look at life and make right decisions, to make right plans and to make the right call and to have discernment. And the more we seek God and the more we like this, have integrity and pray, then God gives us a plan and we start working it out as God reveals things to our heart. And why is wise, folks, to take time and you're facing issues and decisions to think, take time. It's prayer time and it's also think time. And it's pretty simple. The, all, every situation I'm, I, 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 I am faced with, I ask these three questions. You know, where am I now? And where, where do I want to be? And how am I going to get there? That's pretty simple, isn't it? Where am I right now? Where do I want to be? What's God leading me to do? How am I going to get from point A to point B? What's going to happen in that process? How's it going, what's it going to take to get there? And that's, that's where this thought time comes in, and that's where this prayer time comes in. And this is where Nehemiah gives us a real picture, that it's clear from reading that passage that when it came time and he, he moves on responding to the king, for four months his mind has been doing more than just you know, worrying about stuff, more than just being frustrated about stuff. As far as a leadership law, you could write this down, failing to plan just means planning to fail. Just plan, you just plan to fail if you're not going to plan. But how often, again, we kind of move over here to the, 
to the pragmatic side, well, I've got a decision to make when we don't pray. Or here, you know, I don't want to face the decision. I'll just pray about stuff and let God work it all out. And we never choose to be obedient or to move out on what God's telling us to do. All right? God gives vision. And God gives passion for something. And then he expects you to use this God-given intellect that he's given you. He said, it ain't much. Hey, it's enough. All right? I'm a witness. It's enough. Not of you. I'm witnessing myself. It's enough. It's enough. God, give me what I need. But I need to, to be willing to, to, to think these things through and follow through with whatever the Lord is telling me to do in regard to this. All right? The second thing is prepare for the opportunity. In other words, when the, oppor- when the door opens, you know, you need to be prepared to go through it. He says, in the month of Nisan, the 20th year of Artaxerxes, the wine was before for him. I took it and gave it to the king, and I, I'd never been sad in his presence before. That's a pretty strong statement. You know, he, this guy's not a powder, in other words. There's a lot of powders. What's the matter? He's always walking around with sad What's the matter? In fact, you, you won't even ask anymore because you know they're going to get some sad story. You're just afraid to ask, aren't you? Uh, don't tell me. I ain't got much, that much time. Because <laughs> why? Well, it's the same thing you were pouting about last week and the week before and the week before and the week before. You've never dealt with it yourself. You're not going to deal with it yourself. You're not going to come up and seek God's face on it. You're not going to pray about it. You're just content to live with it. Uh, I'm just not an optimistic person. Well, obviously. <laughs> but where do you find greater hope than with God in a relationship with God? He already told you I have a plan to, to, to bless you. I mean, that's pretty good. And God said that about me. God said that about you. We can believe God. We got something to be excited about. We got something to look forward to. And ultimately, for four months, Nehemiah's been waiting for this opportunity. For waiting for it. Obviously, he hadn't had a sad face. And if you're studying in Proverbs, it tells you the importance of the way you look and the way you act and the way you speak. Finally, the king says, okay, Nehemiah, what's wrong? Notice it says, and I was afraid. Why is he afraid? There's a lot of reasons. One, we've talked about the importance of the words and attitude before the, in a king's presence. So you have to be very careful about and picking your words of what's going to be said because the, guys, the, you know, the king is not like your next-door neighbor and offending him. This guy has the power to have your head cut off. So there's a little bit of trepidation out there. And it says it's the first time I've ever been sad in his presence. But I'm getting ready to ask the king for something. I'm going to ask him for a leave of absence. He's not going to be happy about that. You know? I'm going to ask you for a long leave of absence. You know, I'll be happy about that. And I'm going to ask the king, you know, to uh, give me everything I need to build a wall and permission to do it. And I'm, I'm a little bit fearful of that because king said, not going to be a wall. This ain't Donald Trump we're talking to. <laughs> this is Artaxerxes. He says, no wall, no defenses will be built again for the city of Jerusalem. You build your temple and you can move back there, but no walls. And now he's going to ask him to do something. I mean, this, this is a bold step he's going to take, you know. And, and that's where we have to come to. If we're going to walk in, in faith, you always have to come to the place that we're, you know, we're going to have to move ahead of whatever God's dealing us about in spite of any fears that we may have. You know, we're going to have to just continue to move forward. So we move ahead. I mean, this, is, this takes a boldness, but I believe that boldness is the byproduct of prayer. That he's been a man who's prayed and who's sought God's face, and because of that, he's going to move forward. So here he is. And he starts out, he chooses his word ca- cautiously, all right? May the king live forever. All right? This guy's also the bodyguard for the king. In fact, in the king's presence, what, what you would do if you were the wine taster, you would take a little bit of it, pour it in your hand, and taste it. And if you didn't drop dead, then you could hand it to the king. It tasted right. All right? And then if, when you approach the king to speak, if you did lift your head, you had to have, hold your hand up this way over your mouth so your bad breath wouldn't offend the king. These guys were touchy, huh? <laughs> so you cover your mouth uh, like this. It was an act of politeness when speaking to the king that you'd have your mouth covered at a distance so it wouldn't offend your breath. So you know, there's a lot to be fearful for in the presence of a, of a Persian king. And listen, I love the appeal. He says, my father's graves are in ruins. As we said before, to, you know, that, that, that's a king's, that gets the king's run. Well, how do you have the wisdom to do that? God is speaking through this man because he's prayed and he's planned. He's prepared for this moment. All right? And the next three things that Nehemiah does are very clear evidences that he's a guy who has a plan in place and he's ready to go. Third thing it says we do in our, if we follow his life is he establishes the goal. He said, you know, I answered the king. 
if it pleases the king and your servant found favor in his sight, let, me send, let him send me to the city in Judah where my fathers are buried so I can rebuild the wall. This is specificity. I mean, he gets right down to the point. There's no guessing what Nehemiah's thinking about, no guessing what is on his mind. He has a very clear-cut goal in mind. I want to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. What's your goal? What's your goal for your marriage? What's your goal, you know, in your jobs? What's your goal for your kids? What's your goal in your own life? Do you have any spiritual goals? Some of you have been saying, I really, I really want to grow in grace. I really want to be a spiritual person. But you, you, you've set, you, you, you have no plans. You've set no goals. I mean, what would it take for you to say, hey, I want to read the Bible through in a year? You ever read the Bible, whole Bible through in a year? No. Why? You don't have any plans to do it. Well, I want to. <laughs> we all want to do something, all right? We all want to win the world of Jesus, but it ain't going to happen. Until you do something about it. Well, I just don't feel equipped. Then get equipped. Get a plan together. You, you can do something for the glory of God that will blow even your mind. You can make a difference in your family that will blow your mind. It will blow their mind. There are things that can happen, big things that God can do. But nothing's going to happen if we don't expect anything from God. There are two common goals. We have two common areas usually when we set goals. One is we set them too low. In other words, we set our, our goal based upon what we think we can do instead of what God can do with us. All right? We just, we just don't have But what we need to do is set goals that honor God. How, how do those come? That's where vision comes in. God begins to speak to your heart about what he wants to do. And it's something bigger than you and it's something grand. And sometimes I think the other problem with goal setting, not only set too low, sometimes I think we just try to accomplish them too quickly. And a lot of people look at a goal and it's big and they think, oh, that take too much time. There's too much commitment required. And so they don't do it. You know, they're, 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 there's nothing that happens yet. What's the, what's the old saying? Inch by inch, anything's a cinch. They say, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. One, and that, some of you have some elephants in your life. Amen. Some of you got some big deals you're facing in your life. Some of you have some big issues that are facing your life. You can't be afraid and you got to get to the point where I'm going to pray about this. I'm going to commit this to the Lord. I'm going to expect God to speak to me and this is what I'm going to do about it. Nehemiah said, I, 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 was, I, was, I was sad when I heard about Jerusalem's walls. But we said in this period of four months that go by, what happens? Not only is he affected by the, by the news, but now he begins to realize that God may want to use him. And then if he realizes that, he begins to put together a plan. Now, all that's not necessarily spelled out word for word, but you can see the clarity of it just by reading the story. that something's happening here. He's the cupbearer. Now he's going to be a wall builder. Third thing, the fourth thing is, you got to come up with a deadline because the king even asked him, you know, what are you going to do? Yeah, I answered him, if it pleases the king, your servant has found favor in your sight, let him do this, you know. And he said, then I set out to do it. By the way, don't you like the light? If you aim at nothing, you're going to hit it. Yeah, that's where some of you have been hitting nothing because that's all you've been aiming at is nothing. But the fourth thing is here, as you know, is that you, 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 you can set a deadline. First, you get the prayer settled. Now you're thinking it through. You're preparing now for the opportunities. You ever heard people say, well, that guy has all the luck. He just gets all the breaks. You know, I, what I found out that the more I plan, the so-called luckier I get. <laughs> the more I work towards something, the luckier supposedly I get. He said, how long is this going to take if it pleased the king to send me? And he set a deadline. In fact, I found just basically with setting any goals that need a deadline. Or they're not really goals, all right? You know what you want to do, and then you know when you want to do it. And you ask yourself the question, you know, just how long is this going to king take? He said, verse 6, and the king with the queen sitting beside him asked me, how long is this going to take you? And when will you get back? And I said, please, the king, send me. And I said a time. He doesn't tell us how much time. We don't know how long. We know it took 52, 52 days to build the wall. Supernatural is incredible. We know that another story says he went back in 11 years later. We know if maybe he made a trip back before then, but the king gave him permission ultimately to be, to be the, you know, the overseer and the leader and the, and the judge and the deputy over that, that province. He takes leadership and becomes a leader there. So we, we don't know exactly in the moment of time here, but Nehemiah just says, hey, I, I want to go back, rebuild the wall around the city where my father's graves are. And he basically, he gives him a time. Now, but it doesn't stop there. The fifth thing in this process is you anticipate the problems. Verse 7, if it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of the trans-Euphrates so they'll provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. In other words, it's a thousand miles away. 
I'm going to be going through several provinces just to get there. And it's not like you just have freedom to travel from country to country any more than you do today, unless you're in the European Union, perhaps, up between Mexico and Texas. But <laughs> you had to have passports. You had to have papers. You had to have letters from those who are in authority, or you wouldn't get through anywhere. In other words, Nehemiah has taken careful planning to think out everything he's got to, he's got to go through. And this is, this is where it gets exciting to me because when he presents this to the king, he doesn't stop there. He just goes through and he, he, he's obviously anticipated all the problems he's, he's, he's going to face. And he deals with each one of them right then and there so he doesn't have to go back and ask later. What do I, what do I need? That's what real planning does. Okay, I have a situation here. So maybe I do want to be a, a witness for Christ. And I haven't been a witness for Christ. What I need? I need to learn how to be a witness for Christ. So I'm going to do some study. I'm going to read some books. I'm going to learn how to boldly share my faith in Jesus Christ. I'm going to go with those who do this already. I'm going to learn from them. I'm going to make some choices. I'm going to go out. In fact, I'm going to make a plan, and I'm going to go out on Thursdays. Or whatever. I've got somebody at the office. They need Jesus, and I've been hesitant. Uh, how am I going to reach them? Come up with a plan. And in your heart, if God's given you that burden already, he's going to begin to reveal to you very practical steps that you can take. But you're going to have to sit down, think it through, anticipate the problems, and do what needs to be done. There's a lot of people that just manage their life. They don't really are not leaders in life. And you say, what do you mean? They see a problem, they deal with the problem, they just kind of work it through a little bit through, you know, and they focus on just solving the problem as it is. But leaders already see the problem coming before long before it ever gets there. Because they've taken the time in advance not to wait for something to sneak up on them. They've taken the time to advance and say, you know, this could be the issue down the road that I'm going to face. A manager focuses on solving today's problems, but leaders, they focus on tomorrow's problems. And this is where prayer comes in. This is where discernment comes in. This is where wisdom comes in. You're focused more on just what happens today. The task of leadership is to assume a position where I'm going to anticipate the problems that nobody else is even thinking about. And I'm going to figure out a way to resolve those problems long before they happen. Right now, we're in the process of planning a new facility for our location over in the Magnolia campus. We're looking through at every problem long before we ever have to deal with those problems and so that we're not running around chasing permission slips and permits and all the other stuff, last second stuff, because we know what we want to do. And we realize that there's an issue. And we start laying those things. We're already developing the committees and the groups, everything that's involved. And each one of those will be responsible saying, what are we going to have to be ready for? What are we going to have to face? What are we going to have to deal with when it happens? So it's dealt with long before it ever gets there. Proverbs 22 re references this and, and speaks of, of having this attitude. From the Living Bible, it says, a prudent man foresees the difficulties ahead and prepares for them. The simpleton just goes blindly on and suffers the consequences. Proverbs 23 in the New America says, the prudent man, he, seeks, he sees the evil and hides. And that word in the Hebrew means he prepares himself. But the naive, they just go on and they're, un and they're punished for it. What, what? They, they suffer for it. I mean, how many people I've talked to in counseling over the years, it's real easy to get into a relationship. Once you get into it, it's a little hard to get out of it. <laughs> a lot of people easily get into debt. Anybody have any problem getting into debt? Another thing, getting out of debt. Unless you plan for it. Unless you're making plans. How am I going to deal with this problem now? It's easier to fill up your schedule than to eliminate things from the schedule. It's just, it's just the principle of life in every area. That you look at what's going on, and part of this is you realize what it's going to cost you to do something. All right? You realize there's the deal, which brings us to the next point. The sixth point is you have to calculate the cost. He says, listen, I also need a letter to, the, to Asaph, the king's keeper, king's force. Apparently, he, he, he probably went out and met this guy if he hadn't didn't know him before <laughs> and made arrangements that this day is going to be coming up. And I'm sure he, he had familiarized himself who the keeper of the forest was. So he'll give me timber to make beams for the gates, the citadel, the temple, and for the city wall. And, hey, I have to have a place to live, <laughs> the residence that I'm going to occupy. Isn't this great? Why are you so sad? The city where my fathers are buried lies and runs. What do you need? Boom. He has counted the cost. He just go. It's like he gives him a shopping list. One, I want you to let me go. Two, I want you to give me permission to rebuild the wall. Three, I need protective letters to, as, as I go through the provinces. By the way, I want you to pay for it. <laughs> he, asked for, he asked for lumber. Well, I want to build three things. It's, obviously, he's planned. He's counting. I need lumber for, for to build the gates, 
the wall, uh, part of the city gates. I need some beams there. And, uh, hey, I'm going to need lumber for the city walls. There's places where that'll need some. And, by the way, I, I, I have to build a home. I mean, he guy never built anything, but he's ready to build the city. <laughs> and a house and the walls and the gates. He lays out exactly what he wants. The first step to leadership, remember, is prayer. But the second step is you're going to have a plan of what you believe God wants you to do, and you're going to carry it out. Obviously, it's kind of the cost. I look over my shoulder today, and I see back through the history of the time that I have given my life to Jesus Christ. I have lots of people I've known that have given their life to Jesus Christ, supposedly, but you couldn't find them with a search warrant. They're nowhere near God, nowhere near the church, and nowhere near the cross. And you say, what happened? I believe a lot of them didn't count the cost. They just didn't count the cost. This issue of being saved is giving your life to Jesus Christ. That's the one reason that I didn't want to give my life to Jesus Christ. I wanted my life. I want to live for me. I want to do my thing. And I realized the more that I had a mature understanding of what Christianity was, it meant to give up yourself, deny yourself, take up the cross, follow me. That's not, that's not unique Christianity. That is Christianity. That's not a special kind of Christianity. That's Christianity. You give your life to Jesus. You follow Jesus. You sign up and you get on board. And you go where he goes. Amen. Somebody ought to say amen. He's thought it through. I said, Lord, I don't want to get, I don't give my life to you. I don't want to give up everything. But when it got to the point to give up everything, the day came, guess what? I laid it all in his hands. Now, I didn't realize what all was. At that moment, because I'm beginning to find out that under that contractual all, there's a lot of stuff comes under that. Kind of like getting married, right? <laughs> it was easy to say, you know, I've sickness and health. Better or worse, you know, good or bad, I'm on board, you know, until good or bad hits. Good's fine, bad's another problem. Jesus said in Luke 14, you know, anybody going to sit down and build a building? If you're planning to build a tower, you sit down first, you figure out what it's going to cost you, see if you have enough to finish the job. All right? You make some plans. Who's speaking there? It's Jesus. What's he advocating? Coming up with a plan. Here's your plan. Here's what it's going to cost. Here's what it's going to take. He asked for the king's permission. Can I have permission to go build the wall? And then he gets on further to ask for everything he's going to need. Most of us wouldn't have dared to ask for anything else at that point. Amen? Now, Brother Tim can relate to this. He oversees a lot of ministries. So can Crystal. He's on the staff here. We oversee, you know, five or six full-time people around here. But we also, there's hundreds of ministries. I mean, there's just hundreds of people involved in ministry. All right? And it's always interesting to see in this process as ministries are developed. I've always told people, we don't start ministries here. We raise some disciples up and God puts a ministry in their heart in that ministry. Everything that's happened around here pretty much has been that it. That's, that's the way it's all happened, from food pantry to, to, to Bible studies to lift groups. I mean, God raises up someone. God, God puts something on a heart. I mean, it's just God doing stuff in people's hearts. But here's what happens a lot of times. Some people succeeded it greatly, and some people fell miserably at it. And this is kind of the distinguishing part of what we're preaching on today. I talked to God one time and said, I want to start a bus ministry. Said, that's fantastic. What can we do to help? You know, six months later, there's still no bus ministry. What happened? Oh, Brother Joe, I didn't realize there's going to be so many problems. I want to teach this group. I want to do this with that group. I want to do this with that. Oh, no, they didn't show up. You've got to go get them. You've got to bring them. You've got to work on them. You've got to make phone calls. You've got to invite people. You've got to love folks. You've got to have compassion for people. That's what it takes. You know? But people don't count the cost because they, you know, they, they, it's, it's, you know, they, they fall under the, the, I'm the, I'm the sluggard mode, you know, I'd rather do that. And then a lot of times people want to start a ministry and uh, you ask them, what do you need? Oh, you know, everybody's going to do it. We're just all going to do it together. You know what that usually means? It ain't going to get done. Because God doesn't use everybody. God uses someone. So it's going to be done. It's going to be done by someone. Someone's going to lead the way. Someone's going to take up the burden. Someone's going to lead the charge. And that someone can get some other someone's, but it's got to start with that someone who says, I'm willing to pay a price. I'm willing to stay late. I'm willing to get there early. I'm, I'm willing to do whatever it takes. And we've got people get here way early for services. We've got people to stay late to do service for the Lord. 
people that go further and dig deeper and reach higher and climb further. And those are the people that God's doing something glorious in. And when they stand before God, they're going to stand there with rewards and treasures and blessings that others aren't going to have because they never planned for that day when we stand before the Lord, when there's a loss or receiving of rewards before the Lord. They always had an excuse. The problem is they never really counted the cost and what it was going to take to do something for the glory of God. And in you taking the charge means ultimately you're going to ask for assistance. You know, there's going to be somebody in calculating the cost that you know you're going to have to ask for somebody to help. And other people say that's only rather I don't do it because I just know they're going to say no. My response is, well, at least give them the opportunity to say it themselves. <laughs> Amen. Don't say no for them. That's why I let people invite people to church. Oh, they're just going to say no. The great Karnak. So you older folks know who that is. <laughs> you think you got it all figured out? Hey, this is where the last step comes most importantly in. You got to believe God. Believe God that God will move on your behalf. James said you don't have because you don't ask. All right? There's this incredible bonus on his part of asking. You know, why is he at? Because for four months he sought God's face and now it's an opportunity to, to is God going to do this? You know, this, this is the element we talk about risk takers, but it's really a wise risk. It's taken after the process of seeking God's face and then planning with a heart before the Lord. So really faith, it, it's faith and it, it's not risk. And he's getting ready to ask this king who doesn't want the walls rebuilt. He's getting ready to ask him to rebuild the wall. God's going to have to do something here. God's going to have to move beyond just a, being a good buddy here. It's going to take an act of God to move in this man's heart. Proverbs it tells us this in chapter 21, that the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, and he directs it like a water courses wherever he pleases. In the process of teaching my kids how to make an appeal, they, well, you know, one, one response from my mother, oh, well, Dad, you just know you're going to say no anyway. Well, have you prayed about it? You thought, talked to the Lord about this? Made some plans there? Then why don't you see what God does with Dad's heart? God can change my heart. Amen. God can change the king's heart. He can change your boss's heart. You say, I've been wanting to start a Bible study at work, but I just know what they're going to say. Again, you're going to answer for them? Have you prayed about it? You have given God an opportunity to do something, to move? It may not be this week. For four months have gone by here for this guy. And finally now, just the first opportunity to begin to ask this question. But I want you to know when it comes time, he's on it and he's ready for it because he sought God's face. Well, my boss is really unsympathetic to any kind of thing like that. And, you know, I, I, I just don't know. Well, don't go out and try to manipulate him, play games with him. Talk to God about it first. And see what God does in moving in someone's heart. Talk, talk to God before you talk to your husband. Talk to God before you talk to your wife about it. Talk to God before you speak to your kids. Kids, speak to, speak to God before you speak to your parents. This is, boy, this, this is something to change the rest of your life. You get this down. It'll literally change. It'll, it'll bring you from a whole world of living and kind of worrying about stuff and being stricken with just fear and just being, you know, agitated and having chewing acids all day and all, you know, or just being consumed by stuff and how are we going to make it? No, no. God's on your side because you're on his side. God said, I want to do something in your life. I, I'd like to do something big in your life. I, I, the Apostle Paul said, you're letters. You're the children of God. We're letters to be read of all men. Hey, God wants a good letter. <laughs> you're the letter of recommendation for the kingdom. You're the representative. And I don't think Nehemiah's moving to the situation where he's trying to manipulate the king. When he was asked what was wrong, he's saying, my hometown's a shambles. And he didn't make up some phony story. He didn't try to appeal to some other base other than what the Lord told him to. He didn't come up with any false pretenses just to get back to Jerusalem and check things out. He didn't try to manipulate the king. He doesn't try to trick the king. He didn't play games with the king. He didn't use any deceit. He just talked to God about it first. And then when the opportunity came, he spoke to the king about it. And he knew God would be on it because this is something God has stirred up in his heart. He said, I don't know if it's God's will. I can't escape it. I mean, in the early days, you used to take trips to Israel. We'll be taking another one, by the way, in, in November 2017. But a lot of people sat back and said, well, I just can't afford to go, and I don't know if I can afford to go or not. I just, I just think it worked for me. I said, well, do you think God wants you to go? What do you mean? God want me to go to Israel? I said, well, yeah, well, it's worth asking. You know, don't answer for God much you don't answer for anybody else. What's God want? He said, I have a plan for peace for you. I want to bless you. So ask God if he wants you to go to Israel. 
And if he wants you to go to Israel, he says, well, how do I know if he wants me to go to Israel? He says, because you won't be able to escape it. The desire will stay in your heart. You know, it just be there. You know, the Bible talks about God will give you the desires of your heart. That's what that means. Not your desires, his desires for your life is what that deals with. So you cast your cares upon him. You commit your ways to him. And God starts working in your heart. And if you can't escape it, whatever it is you're dealing with here, then God wants to do something. Then you can count on it. Then you can confess it. Then you can believe it. And then you need to come up with a plan. Here's how we're going to get to there. Because God's behind this and God's on this. And God will work it out. I love it when he says here, and this is the important part of all leadership in our spiritual life here. After all these things and all have been done, the conclusion is his conclusion. The gracious hand of God was upon me. There's nowhere in this letter, nowhere in this journal where Nehemiah is giving himself credit for all this. There's no place. He's just saying, praise God. God was on. He doesn't give the king credit for it. He just said, praise God did this. God did this. You know, there's, there was a, it was on thing, Ronald Reagan's death, there's no end to what man can, can do when he doesn't care who gets the glory for it. I think we should put it like this. There's no end to what one man can do if he's only concerned that God gets the glory for it. There's no end to what we can do. But we live such a little frail, pitiful life so often and don't accomplish those great things for God. We don't reach out. We don't make difference in people's life. You know, the, the leadership principle is pretty simple. We give God glory, you know. We give God glory. And, and the Living Bible says we, we, we make our plans, but the final outcome is in God's hands. Amen. Contemporary said version says that we humans make plans, but the Lord has the final word. Doesn't matter what they say, what they do. God's still in charge. He's got the final word on this. True leaders look to God and give God the glory that he's doing and do it for what they're doing, for the glory of God. You're trusting the Lord to do something. Ephesians 3 says, you know, God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we think or ask. So after the incident here, I went back to the governor of the trans-Euphrates and he got me started. And he started on his journey, his way. And I gave him the king's letter. And that catches. And the king had also, he didn't ask for this, had also sent army officers and cavalry with me. <laughs> That's right. Just God, God takes care of all of it, you know. Oh, yeah, I can, I can take some extra security. I'll take a detail. Amen. Bring, bring that along. This is, you know, this, this is the grace of God. This is the sovereignty of God. We pray and we let God do something in our spirit, you know, and then we expect God to do some things. We, we're trusting him for success and we believe him for success. And that's where leadership comes in. It means that we prepare for it. We're taking the worries and the fears and the agitations and we're bringing them into the, to, into the, to the, the tent of prayer. And we deal with it there. And we let God apply whatever he needs to to our hearts. I mean, these are simple things. That, and it, it, as simple as this all is, it deals with every aspect. I mean... You, you sit there and say, I, 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 every year I say, I'm going to read the Bible through, but I don't. Well, get a plan. You can Google one. How to read the Bible through in one year. <laughs> That's where something Google's good for. <laughs> you have a plan set aside to read the Bible? Well, I'm going to read the Bible every day, and I want to pray every day, but I really don't do that. Well, why haven't you done it? Well, when you fail to plan, you plan to fail. It's a plan. Why can I plan? Where are you going to do it? Where are you going to pray in the house? What are you going to need when you get there? I think I ought to put uh, my Bible over there and get a prayer journal to put over there. Maybe a lamp. Might get some earplugs come with the kids. Might need to do in the bathroom. I don't know. But you come up with a plan. Here's how I'm going to do it. Here's what I'm going to do. It. This is the best time for me to do this. This is, this is when it's going to work out. It's, it's just the simplicity of setting up and then working the plan that you've worked out. You know? You plan the work and then you work the plan. You move forward. That person at work, how are you going to do that? How are you going to speak to that person, that relative you had not talked to about Jesus yet? How are you going to do that? Well, I'm going to do that. Why don't you bring it before the Lord? Why don't you get serious about it? Lord, here's this person. You've been dealing with me about this. I prayed for him, Lord, but now I know you want me to do something. How do you want me to? How, how can I do that? And let God begin to just build something in your heart, you know? And as God does that and you seek God's blessing on it, you know, and you, then there's this expectation what God's going to do, and you're going to leave it in God's hand. You know, someone said, no, make no small plans, for they have not the power to move the souls of men. Make some big plans for the glory of God. Big thinking. It's, it's faith thinking. It's grace thinking. 
You know? Someone said, whatever your plans are, make them big enough they show God off to the world around you. <laughs> they show that God's a great God. I think we get in that, that we're one, we're one two spheres here, you know. And you might even come up with a third. The third sphere is, you know, I don't care about anything. You can get that way in your life. And this other sphere over here is those who just worry about everything. It's that ulcers and acid and indigestion and doubt and headaches and problems and just, you know, it just kind of bears on you. And all these heavy things are, are just, you know, and, and you, know, you, you need to get strategic in your life. And it starts with your heart getting right with God, as we said in that first lesson. Then it starts with you spending time with God. And then three, letting God give you the plan and start working that plan. But too many people spend more energy worrying about failure or the problem instead of planning for success in that arena of their life. And what's happening is they're just wasting their life. And certainly, if you spend more time worried about stuff and seeking God for it, you're definitely wasting your energy. What is the Lord speaking to your heart about today? Maybe, and I really believe it's probably not something that's even mentioned today. It's something that's already, if I did mention it, it's probably already mentioned in your heart because it's so unique the way God works. You know, he, 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 I told a group this morning when baptism, we had a lot of visitors there, and some obviously didn't know the Lord. I said, I, I, I do not doubt that this is the first time anybody shared with you your need to get right with God because that's the way God, he's a big God. He's always working out there where we don't see it. And when we don't see it, we choose to live by sight instead of by faith. And we say, oh, yes, there's no hope. Don't live, that. don't live your life that way. Don't live your life that way. If we're going to be leaders, and I believe God's called us all to be leaders in the culture we're living in. Let's make plans that glorify God in every area that we're, we're responsible for. In every area of our arena of influence. Let's have a plan for it that glorifies God. That means you're going to have to commit some time to the Lord. You have to commit yourself to the Lord. But man, God will do great and mighty things which you know not. Jeremiah 33, 3. Isn't that the promise? Call unto me. It starts out, call unto me. I'll show you great and mighty things. But you've got to seek God's face. Let's stand together. Father, thank you for your word.